So if I seem nervous, it's because when I was updating my, my presentation, I realized the last time I performed this, and I can't say a performance because it does feel like a performance, but the last time I gave this talk, it was the before times. It was 2019, and it was MAGFest. <laughs> thank you, thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you, everybody. Welcome to MAGFest! I didn't care if we filled the theater, I didn't care if we filled the, if I had five people. I'm gonna give this exactly the same energy level that I would give it because I am so excited to be back at MAGFest. It feels so freaking good. Now, I do have to ask though, just on the off chance, because I know I got a lot of people scattered in here, I do, have to ch I do have to check, has anybody seen me, either here or Awesome Con or some other event, have you seen me do the big score? No, I have an entirely new audience. <laughs> Great, then let me bring you up to speed with house rules. So throughout the night, throughout, throughout this presentation, I'm gonna be asking you some trivia questions. You know, identify this movie or something along those lines. So I've got stuff here and uh, if you win, please one prize only. I don't want one person walking out of here with all the stuff. But I've got stuff here ranging from uh, loot crate stuff, gaming stuff, Escape from New York, Camp Crystal Lake, stuff I don't want in my house anymore. It's all yours. It's all yours. You just got to get the, get the question right. And I'm going to try to get the people in the back because, you know, unless you want to come up, which is fine, but I mean, I'm, they, they mic'd me, so I'm, I'm thrilled. So this is the big score. And before we go any further, let's get the, let's get the, let's get the, the, the self-promotion stuff out of the way because when you do these types of panels, of course, you're gonna be doing some self-promotion. So if you wanna get in touch with me, this is where you find me on PlayStation, where you find me on Untapped, on Threads. Oh wait, I'm sorry, hold on. There we go, fixed. <laughs> and this is, this is the, what I've been doing since the before times. I'm still a writer. I still write books. I'm actually working on the fifth edition of Podcasting for Dummies. I'm also the author behind the second edition of Twitch for Dummies. And I also write steampunk with my wife. But you'll also notice around here some, some stuff from Old Spirits Investigations. Well, during the pandemic, and now we're in our, to our uh, third season on YouTube, I got into paranormal investigation, <laughs> as you do. And uh, if you wanna find out more about that transition, Weather permitting, tomorrow I'm going to be doing a panel in panel five with Blind Gamer Steve and Ash Said Hi on gaming out of your comfort zone. It fits to me getting into paranormal investigation, and if you want to hear that story, that's for tomorrow. But along with paranormal investigations, writing science fiction and fantasy and horror, and also writing for dummies books, I was also a band geek. Uh, this is me, uh, sometime in... And uh, I was marching with the James Madison University Marching Royal Dukes. Now, before I go any further, I gotta see if my people are in the audience. So, show of hands, who here played an instrument either in... Uh, okay, great. Played an instrument in high school, in, in college, in, in middle school, great. Keep your hands up if you were in the brass section. Oh dear. Oh dear. Keep your hands up if you're a trombone player. My people! Did you go to the trombone panel earlier? No, there was a trombone. Well, well my, my buddy Steve and I, we got caught in traffic. So, uh, in fact, that's Steve coming out of traffic right now. Hi, hi Steve. <laughs> so a lot, the thing I loved about being, particularly in the marching band, the thing I loved about being in the marching band was they didn't mind my geek flag flying high as pictured here in a Halloween rehearsal. And you'll notice that I'm wearing surgical gloves. That was the only way I could hold on to the instrument because I was wearing all the, 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 the paste makeup. I was like, this isn't gonna work. So I went on ahead and got a pair of surgical gloves. And that's what this panel really is. This is my marriage of my love of science fiction, my love of fantasy, my love of horror, and my love of music. The first album I ever bought with my own money was in fact, um, the double LP of the Star Wars soundtrack back in 1977, John Williams. Yeah, that was the first album. I still have it. And I still remember my parents going, are you sure you want to buy this? It's just the music. And I'm like, I know. So, so that's, what, that's what this is. I'm, I'm going to take you through a brief history 
of uh, science fiction cinema. And when I say science fiction cinema, I do mean science fiction, fantasy, and horror, okay? That's what, the, that's what this, uh, this breaks down to. So first trivia question of the night. Again, we'll be doing with a show of hands just to see who I can get to first. But uh, we're gonna start at the beginning. Start at the beginning of, of this cinematic journey. Can anyone tell me what this opened? Science fiction, fantasy, horror. And this opened for one of the biggest uh, movies of that age. I saw a hand go up back here. Do you have a guess? Well, no, no, it's, it, it's not Swan Lake. <laughs> that is the music. But can anyone name the movie? It is not Fantasia. It is, in fact, Dracula, 1931. And this was how music was handled in cinema. Now, before this, during the silent age, you could go to four different theaters, see the same film. It would have four different soundtracks because each musician did something different or each music ensemble did something different. Well, when sound was introduced into cinema, that was when somebody said, hey, we've got to get on top of this. We got to make sure that, that, we're, that we're, uh, we're, we're calling the shots and we're doing exactly what it is we want to do. And so that was why you heard Scheherazade at the beginning of The Mummy. That's why you heard this, uh, you know, you heard Swan Lake in front of Dracula because it was advertised on its opening day of Valentine's Day as a love story for the ages. <laughs> okay, doesn't age too well, but okay. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so this was the 1930s, and just give me a second here. I wanna check something before I go any further. Okay. So, music around this time, when they started to do original scores, were not necessarily what I would call memorable scores for science fiction. So here we go. Again, hands up if anybody can name. You'll get a hint, but if anybody can name what this movie is, Here comes your hint. In the back, shout it out. Nope. This is, in fact, the opening fanfare for Flash Gordon Conquers the Universe, 1940. This is done by Frank Skinner and Clifford Vaughn. I want to make sure this is clear, though. It's Skinner and Vaughn, not Queen. This is not the soundtrack from Queen. But here's the thing to know about this music. A lot of this music was built to be, and I hate to use this word when it comes to music, it was disposable. Uh, and, and it was unforgettable. And that was, the, that was the fair of science fiction around the 40s. Because you had movies like The Shadow of the Bat with Bela Lugosi. Shocker that. You had Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein. This was the fair. The, the best science fiction you could find was, in fact, Buster Crabbe as Flash Gordon. But then we got into the 50s, and everything was different in the 50s. Because of the way uh, World War II ended, people were now talking about atomic energy. People were talking about sending satellites to orbit the Earth. And then, wait a minute, you want us to go where? The moon? Are you serious? Of course, this opened up a lot of doors for science fiction cinema. And it demanded its own sound. Oh, wow. Straight out of the bat. What? No, it's not. It is not Forbidden Planet. Yes. No, it is not Star Trek. You're off by about 10 years. It was, it was really good. It was real, it, I give it three. I give it three. And you might have just missed it. But it is the day the Earth stood still, 1951. The score is by Bernard Herrmann. We're going to come back to Bernard a little later. But here's the thing about that sound. No one had ever heard anything like that before in 51. In fact, one, uh, one thing in particular was that instrument that went the theremin, right, the theremin. And the way that this ties back to my ghost hunting, if you've seen any paranormal investigations, you know that we use something called a REM pod. The same principles on a REM pod are with a the theremin. 
The only difference is that when something breaks the electromagnetic field created by the REM pod, it sends out an alert. With a theremin, you can break the field and actually sustain the note, and then you can raise your hand up and down and create different notes. This was the signature sound of science fiction. But a few years later, that would actually change. I'm gonna let this play for a bit. Would you care to guess what this movie is? <laughs> what do you know we were going to tonight? Forbidden Planet, 1956. Now, I popped this in here for two reasons. One, it took two years for them to make this movie. Two years. This literally was the Ten Commandments of science fiction, right? But the other cool thing about this was the soundtrack. Now, Bebe and Louis Barron, they didn't use any conventional instruments to create the music. Everything you're hearing is electronically created. And that's pretty amazing for 1956. And the reason I bring it up is that they laid down the groundwork. Because had Bebe and Louis not taken that little bit of extra and created music electronically, we would have never gotten this theme from the BBC Radiophonic Workshop. Everything you're hearing here, there are no conventional instruments. It is all created, not digitally, but electronically. And this is part of the spin-off, if you will. These, this, is, this is part of what we got because of the work done on Forbidden Planet. And I've been covering a lot of science fiction, I know. I've been covering a lot of science fiction. But when it came to trying to tap into the fears, and no, this, I have a feeling you'll all know what this is. And if you don't know what this is, shame on you. But what happened in the 50s was, were directors and composers working together very closely and they would get incredible results. And this is the, uh, this is the fruits of one of those relationships. <laughs> You better know what this is. If you don't know what this is, shame on you. <laughs> this is Alfred Hitchcock's Psycho, 1960. Again, Bernard Herrmann, a lot of people said that his best work was done with Alfred Hitchcock. And it was because they always collaborated. They always worked together. They always shared notes. And one of the notes that they shared was about this particular scene. Now, everybody remembers, well, hands up, who, who here has, let me ask, who here has not seen the original Psycho? <sighs> wow. Okay. You're about to get spoiled. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, when Norman Bates is having the lunch in the parlor, there were a couple of things to point out about this scene. One, they were already making color film, but Alfred Hitch Hitchcock insisted on black and white, mainly for the shadow play. But the other thing they insisted on is that when they stuffed the birds that were in his office, they were all in attack mode. Which is why when you're, when you're watching the office and you see that owl, for example, when there's a big close-up of, you're a little unsettled by it. That's why. Because it was the, all the birds that you see in, in Norman Bates' office is in attack mode. Bernard Herman latched onto that. And because he latched onto that, we got this. I see someone rocking. Yeah, he was, whoops. He was supposed to be mimicking. I'm sp hang on a minute. Hang on. Fumbalaya, foul on the play. 10 yards, first down. Are we all caught up? There we go. Now we're caught up. Now we're caught up. So the idea was that when you heard that sound, it was supposed to be mimicking birds attacking. And when you think about how iconic that particular riff is, how many times you yourself may have said to somebody, I was absolutely, I had a terrible, how bad of a day did you have at work today? And that was, that was the work of Bernard Herrmann. And it was these type of collaborations, you know, directors and composers working together to create art, that the real magic happened. 
And there was one particular composer that wanted to make that magic happen again. He had a really good film experience with this one director. And then he said, can we work together? Can we work together? Can we work together? And I'm going to actually play for you some of the score from that relationship, from one of the most important science fiction movies of the time. I'm going to have to let this play for a bit. So the year is 1968. The composer was Alex North. And he kept asking this one director, I really want to work with you again. I really love to work with you. Can we work again? And finally, knowing that, he was that this particular director was working on a very big film, he said, you're on. You have two weeks. Two weeks to, compo to write, compose, arrange, rehearse, and record a science fiction soundtrack masterpiece. And when I say Alex North broke his back making this happen, I'm not kidding. During conducting of one of the rehearsals, he literally threw his back out. And while they were carrying him off on the stretcher, he had, for 1968, a portable phone. And he was talking to the assistant composer, making sure that none of the notes were missed because he couldn't afford the time. He had to make the two-week deadline. And he did. Alex North took that score that you just heard and gave it to the director, and the director said, thank you. And there Alex was, opening night, 1968. Put yourself in those shoes. You literally broke your back making this score in two weeks. The lights go down, the curtain goes up, and this is what you hear. I'm not, that, no, that's a, that's a softball right there, but this is the story behind it. Yeah, Stanley Kubrick, during the production of 2001 A Space Odyssey, was using something called test reels. And on the test reels, he was putting classical music. And he was really kind of digging it. And he said, you know what? I think we're going to lead this here. He told everybody but one person. Alex North. And Alex North discovered on opening night that not one note of his music was appearing in 2001 A Space Odyssey. Now you might be sitting there shaking your head going, man, that's a dick move. Consider the source. During the filming of uh, the movie Dr. Strangelove, George C. Scott was hired to do comedy, something that he didn't have a lot of experience doing. So Stanley said, I got a great idea. Here's what we're going to do. You're going to do some rehearsal stuff. And it's going to be over the top, completely ridiculous. Don't worry about a thing. It's just to loosen you and everybody else up. Well, Scott, being a classically trained actor, said, that sounds like a great idea. So when he got on the set, he went for broke. He did stuff he would never do. Kubrick was filming the whole time. Not one, not one scene that, Coop, that, uh, that George C. Scott rehearsed and then performed, made it to the final cut. It was all rehearsal stuff. When did George C. Scott find out about this? Opening night. Opening night. But you can't mention Kubrick and not talk about Shelley Duvall. Now, everybody remembers this scene from The Shining, for those of you who've seen it. This is the scene with the bat where she's swinging the bat at Jack Nicholson. You might notice that on some swings, she is cut in the air, and there are some swings where she's doing it like this. That's because she was probably on her 115th take. Because after 128 takes, he was happy. Now, you might think, wow, that's intense. Mm. One more thing you gotta know about The Shining, it was filmed chronologically. So when this scene happens in the bathroom later, two people, knew that that axe was coming through the door. And it wasn't Shelley Duvall, it was Jack Nicholson and director Stanley Kubrick, who thought, hey Jack, wouldn't it be fun if you improvised? So when that axe is coming through and you see Shelley Duvall with that look on her face and she's saying, stop Jack, stop, 
Makes you wonder, was she talking to Jack Torrance or Jack Nicholson? Stanley Kubrick, everybody. Cinematic genius and kind of a dick. So this is the way it went for many decades in science fiction film. And then when we got to the 70s, not only was the tone of science fiction changing, but the instruments were as well. So who can name this one? This is the soundtrack to Logan's Run, or as I like to call it, the film about Twitch streamers when they freak out when they hit 30. Logan's Run was a big film of its day. It was epic. And they got Jerry Goldsmith to score it. Now, Jerry Goldsmith is no, he is no crouching violet, I think, that, or, or uh, shrinking violet, thank you, I, that was close. Shrinking violet, that's why, I'm, that's, why, that's why writers have editors, they get the right words in. Uh, he was no shrinking violet to sci-fi. He did the score to Planet of the Apes, he did the original uh, score to the original Alien, and he also did the score to one of my favorite Star Trek films of all time, Star Trek First Contact. But what was really key about this was the Moog synthesizer that you heard at the very beginning. This was brand new cutting edge technology. No one had ever heard anything like that. And it was Goldsmith that took the epic sound of orchestra and mixed it with the Moog synthesizer to create this sound. And in 76, we were all convinced this is the sound of sci-fi. That lasted for a whopping year. Because in 77, everything changed. I still remember being a kid, and when I heard that music, I remember going, whoa, and seeing Star Wars, and then the, the opening crawl. So many memories to this fanfare. And the beautiful things about John Williams, again, no shrinking violet. He had done the, the score on television for Land of the Giants and Lost in Space. The year before, he had already done Jaws. And the beautiful thing about John Williams, he is still composing music today because Dial of Destiny, I was convinced with somebody else, and when I found out that it was John Williams, I'm like, you know what? This works for me on so many different levels. I was actually having a debate with Steve about this on the way in. Honestly, if you have not seen Dial of Destiny, I'm gonna just lay it out here and I will die on this hill. Is it as good as the original? No. Is it as good as The Last Crusade? No. Is it better than The Crystal Skull? Sorry, I'm a bit passionate about that. Um, this, was the, this was the way I wanted Indiana Jones to hang up his hat. And John Williams knocks it out of the park. He has not lost a beat. And he is in his 90s. And it's really nice to know that he is still making music. So here we are, 1977. We get Star Wars. Everything's big. Everything's bold. Everything is in your face. But not everybody has the Lucasfilm budget. And one director who had already written the script said, you know what, I'm going to do the soundtrack as well. And people were like, whoa, 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 I don't, I think you're taking on too much. But it turns out that this writer and director, he knew exactly what he was doing. No, that one's not up because look, it's too close to Halloween right now. And I do mean Halloween the season. But yeah, this is the, this is the song that we hear Every this is the Halloween version of, of Mariah Carey, okay? Let's be honest. And yet we're not sick of it. Every time you hear it, you're like, oh, it's Halloween. Trick-or-treaters are out. And little kids coming up to houses when they hear this, they have no clue. They have no clue. But what was so brilliant about this was that it actually gave a theme, and it hadn't been heard since Psycho, or maybe Jaws. But now we have a, we have a theme, and we had it in a movie that nobody expected great things from. But this revolutionized the horror movie as it was shot 
And John Carpenter went on to score many of his own films. It was, it was his jam, because he never wanted to be a film director. He wanted to be a rock and roller. So now we enter the 80s. Now the 80s, John Williams, it's, his name is all over the 80s. You had Raiders of the Lost Ark, you had, uh, you had The Empire Strikes Back, you had all this great stuff. But then you had this drive, if you will, that Hollywood wanted not just a hit movie, they wanted a hit soundtrack. So they turned to rock and roll bands for soundtracks. I wonder what that sounded like. It sounded like this. And if you guess this movie right, I'm giving you two prizes. No, but you are really close. This is Lady Hawk, 1985, and no, you're not seeing things. This was written by the Alan Parsons Project because people thought that was a good idea. The Alan Parsons Project, creating an epic fantasy soundtrack. Hey, what's Toto doing right now? How about we get them to score this, this film called Dune? And we got some really painful music out of this time. Some really painful music. And finally, we had to just throw our hands up in the air and say, you know what? Rock and roll bands have no business writing music for film. Here we are, born to be kings. We're the princes of the universe. Now I know what you're thinking. Hold that thought. You gotta wait for the drums. You're probably sitting there thinking, wait a second, T, wait a second. Didn't Queen also score Flash Gordon earlier in the 80s? Yes, they did. Banging soundtrack. Crappy movie. But now we look at him and go, oh, it's Rocky Horror. Cool. Okay. Uh, but no, the reason I bring up Highlander as one of these key things about uh, scoring films is that this music was so good. They kept it when they took Highlander off of the big screen and put it on the small screen. Does anybody remember this show? The first season, little, little dicey, little dicey here and there. But man, what a good show. And every time, they said, you know what? We need to have our audience cry. Somebody drop in who wants to live forever. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on. But that was how good this, this soundtrack is. And not only that, it was also considered one of Queen's best albums. If you didn't know, it's the one called A Kind of Magic, and still one of my favorite uh, albums from Queen. So we still had that big sound, even with rock and roll. Even with rock and roll, we had the big sound. And that was the way it was for science fiction, fantasy, and horror. It was always a big sound, or it was always that ch 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 Something very simple. But one composer, when he was commissioned to create a soundtrack for an epic sci-fi, action-adventure, extravaganza, he chose an entirely different course. Who can name this movie? When you find out what this movie is, you're going to be like, oh, yeah. Watch. This was one of my favorite movies of the 90s. It flopped, and then suddenly everybody got caught up and said, oh, yeah, The Rocketeer. I love that movie. How could you not? Bill, Bill, uh, you, had, you had Bill Campbell. You had Jennifer Connelly, all grown up since Labyrinth. And then you had Timothy Dalton chewing the scenery as Neville Sinclair. And James Warner said, you know what? I want to capture what this film is all about. That wide-eyed wonder. And I loved this movie. And it was nice to see it have sort of a renaissance when it was out in, in rental. And this particular soundtrack remains one of my favorites of all time. So now, we have, now we're recovering all kinds, of, all kinds of bases. But then, in the early 2000s, we had a studio that said, we need to shake things up. We need to go back to the 80s. 
We need to make rock and roll cool, cooler than what it is, right? So where did they turn? They turned to video games, and they turned to this untried uh, composer, and they said, what do you think? He said, you want me to score what? Okay. the trailer we knew this movie was going to be good we didn't know it was going to be this good this is iron man 2000 and 2008 son when were you born okay you're old enough to go see iron man see you see when tony stark was with that young lady they were wrestling okay um raymond dewandi who was known for creating really high impact action scores he stepped up and he did this beautiful union of rock and roll and classical music, which he actually re re replicated once again when he did Pacific Rim. But Iron Man, yeah, that not only was a game changer in the way of the sound of sci fi cinema, this was also the launch of the MCU. And here we are, coming up on 15 years, and I'm like, yep, Echo, that kicks ass. So, you know. Now here's the thing though, I have been covering a lot of the big box office blockbusters, the ones that are expected to make big bank. The cool thing about science fiction though is that you can actually on a very tight budget really create some cinema that stays with you after you've seen it. So again, this is another two prizer because this one's tough, but if you get this, again, you get two prizes. I'm rooting for you. I am. I'm rooting for you. So this is a movie called Under the Skin. If you have never seen it, I, I have to tell you, you gotta see this movie. It is absolutely stunning. Scarlett Johansson plays someone that comes from outer space. She picks up random men, either off the road, car stranded, picks them up in a bar, and then she eats them. Yeah. Um, and the thing that Mika Levy was really taken by was that he was reminded of praying mantises. So he went on ahead and he created a soundtrack that sounded like swarms. And I'm telling you, this movie, this movie actually has a full frontal from Scarlett Johansson. I tell you that because it is not what you think it is. It is one of the most chilling, and one of the most terrifying things I have ever seen on the screen because of her reaction. And it, 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 I just cannot stress enough how good of a movie Under the Skin is. But this is the beautiful thing about soundtracks. They don't go, for, in these types of movies, they don't go for a sound or an earworm or a theme. They go for an atmosphere. It's the backdrop. And you see that in other movies, like for example, and if you haven't seen it again, th these two movies, again, I highly recommend them. Uh, you've got Ex Machina. Uh, this was in 2015. And Landscape with Invisible Hand. This one caught me off guard. It is really, really funny until it isn't. And um, this one, they went back to the theremin. And I had not heard a theremin in a science fiction movie in years. And when I saw it pop up in Landscape with Invisible Hand, I'm like, I love this movie. So yeah, these are all three films that if you write them down, ask me about them afterwards, or sometime you see me at MAGFest, I love all three of these movies. So the question is, okay, this is really cool, T, but where do we go from here? What's the next big thing in sound? Has anything come by that made you go, okay, that was cool? And the answer is yes. And I'm not going to let anybody guess on this one, because in about five or ten seconds, you know exactly which movie this is from. This was the movie that I left lockdown for. And I cannot wait until the second part comes out. And I'm pretty critical of Hans Zimmer. I was a big fan of Hans Zimmer until he started getting into the DCU. 
and it just sounded like it was one note being sustained forever in a day, and I couldn't get over it. But then I heard this soundtrack, and between the chanting of the Bene Gesserit and the mouth, the mouth music of the uh, uh, Sauduka, and the drums of Arkeen, I was, <laughs> I was like, okay, okay, Hans, we cool, we're good, we're good, we're good, my friend, we're good. Now, something else you should know about this talk, I have been giving this talk for a long time. Uh, and it was 2019 was the last time I gave this talk, which has given me time to ask myself, so why do I give this talk? What's the point of me talking about everything we've seen here? And I think the best thing to do is to jump to a clip from this classic. This is Aliens, the, sound, the, the sequel to Alien, 1986. James Horner did the soundtrack for it. So I wanna go on ahead, I wanna jump near the end. And for those of you who haven't seen Aliens, you're gonna be slightly spoiled in this scene. But this is near the end. Uh, Ripley is on the platform with Newt. And I'm just gonna let the scene do the talking. Here you go. So I did what you probably didn't think was possible. I made Alien scarier. I took out the soundtrack. And for those of you sitting there going, when was the last time I felt like this? It was probably during the special edition when you saw Han shoot first. Or sorry, when you saw Greedo shoot first. But the point I'm getting at is, I'm, and I wanna make sure everybody's clear on this, I'm currently getting my certification to be an AI consultant. I love technology. And I'm fascinated by AI, to a point. We just left a strike last year about this very thing, about writers being sidelined for AI, about actors being sidelined for AI. And yeah, I already know, but music and AI, yeah, they're already working together. Haven't you ever heard of autotune? You know, I know that people are doing things in music and AI, I know that people I know artists who have been directly ripped off by mid-journey. I'm not here to tell you AI bad, humans good, but I am here to tell you, and this is another hill I would die on, algorithms cannot create art the same way a human can after going through the condition. There is something magical about the arts, and they all work together. It's not, just, it's not just Sigourney Weaver and, uh, and Carrie Henn and Lance Hendrickson. It's the puppeteers that are working the queen. It's the set designers that are putting together this incredible set. It's the pyrotechnic artists that are knowing when to hit the button, when to make something go off. And of course, there's the writer behind the script, and then there's the director at the helm. And those are people creating incredible art. 
And I will say this, the arts, they do matter. I studied theater, I studied music. I love what happens when people come together and create incredible things. And that's what the science fiction soundtrack is. It's the cast member. It's that favorite performance that you never see. And when it's gone, you miss it. So let's bring that actor back on the stage and let's see that scene the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> And they got on the ship, and they flew off, and everything was cool, right? Whoop! Uh oh, uh oh. So, the piece that you just heard is called Bishop's Countdown. This is the last trivia question of the night. And this one, I'm going to give at least three different guesses. The one closest, and I'm going to say about five. If you get within five movie trailers of this, you're golden. But how many other movie trailers? has Bishop's Countdown been featured in? And if you think you got a number for me, raise a hand. Yes, sir, right here. Six, Six. okay, that's the first one, six. Anyone else? Yes. A dozen. Anyone else? Forty. Okay, way too low, still too low, way too high. There have been 24 movies since 1986 that has used Bishop's Countdown in their marketing of another film. And you're probably thinking, 
Like what? I'm so glad you asked. Because the Alien franchise was so happy with James Horner's work, they said, why don't we go ahead and use it for Alien 3? And yeah, let's use it for Alien Resurrection as well. Cameron, since he already knew Horner, said, yeah, I'll use it for The Abyss. Now this one I vaguely remember from Dusk Till Dawn, but the one that really seared into my brain was James Caan and uh, Kathy Bates in Misery. But the one that was the soft, that was the curveball that I did not see coming, and I laughed with everybody else in the theater, the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy used Bishop's Countdown in their marketing. And this is just six of 24 films to date. Yes, sir. I don't know, but you know what? I, Mars is free to a point. Depends on the performance. But Bishop's Countdown, man, <laughs> I can name that riff in like two notes. I hear it, dun, dun. That's Bishop's Countdown. Aliens. Try it again. But, you know, yeah, I, it, it broke my heart. It, okay. Now, now you're going even deeper. Now you're going deeper. But here's the thing is that it broke my heart to take that music out. I must have rewatched the scene with the music in it at least five times before I went to bed just to cleanse myself. But this brings us to the end of this pre uh, presentation. I really do appreciate your time and I appreciate each and every one of you being here. We're going to leave with one more nod, not necessarily to science fiction, but now when you watch this movie today, you kind of wish it was, well, you realize how much it was science fiction because no, what these people were doing in this film reality of it, it wasn't anything like that. If, I did a rewatch of this. If hacking really was as cool as Johnny Lee Miller and Angelina Jolie made it look, I would have been a computer science major. But as we all know, not one science building basement was featured in this film. I want to make sure everybody is aware of that. But uh, yeah, thank you very much for being here tonight. Again, if you want to catch up with me, if you want to find out what I'm doing with, uh, with my writing or with the paranormal investigation, you can get connected over here. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy MAGFest.